One of the dominant themes in economics in the last couple of years has been the potential impact in the future of automation and robotics on the labor market. And who better to talk to about this than someone who's written so much about it and also happens to be here via telepresence robot. Eric Benjolson, the author of Second Machine Age at the MIT Media Lab. And we're also here with Mariana Matsukado, author of The Entrepreneurial State. All right, so Eric, you first, okay? How optimistic are you that society can deal with the changes that are coming and specifically whether or not automation is going to have a deleterious impact on big swaths of the labor market? Well, I'm actually very concerned about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the technology to create a lot of wealth and abundance. I'm concerned as to how we will respond to it. I don't think there's any single inevitable future. Um, we could easily have a future where the wealth is highly concentrated, uh, or we could have one where there's shared prosperity. It's going to depend a lot on the choices we make over the next five to ten years. Okay. Marianne, I want to talk to you about those choices. You've written a book essentially about the importance of the public sector in getting involved. So talk about the right policy response to some of the changes that Eric's talking about. Well, what we need from policy is really, I mean, in terms of the investments that actually lead to these new great technologies in the future, what we know from the past is that those investments from the public sector have actually had to be along the entire innovation chain. It's simply not true that all you need is, say, to fix market failures in the really upstream public good side, say, of basic research. We know there's lots of applied research and lots of early stage seed financing of companies, the most innovative ones that actually have come. Um, increasingly from the public sector, given that, for example, venture capitalists are so exit-driven, you know, in three years, they want the returns to happen through, for example, an IPO, that's not necessarily the kind of financing mechanism that you need for innovations that actually require 15 to 20 years of patient long-term finance. But I'm both optimistic in terms of the potential, but pessimistic in terms of what I'm seeing today on both the public and the private side. On the public side, we no longer have the sort of willingness and ability uh, to, for governments to think big in a mission-oriented way, which is actually how we got all the technologies that make your iPhone smart from internet, GPS, touchscreen. And we no longer have, I'd say, at least in terms of the large corporations, a commitment towards the long run. So you have lots of companies in both IT and pharmaceuticals that are spending today more on areas like share buybacks than on R&D. Okay. Eric, it sounds like you share this notion uh, that this is fundamentally a political problem, a distributional problem. Can you also add to what Mariana said about what you think governments should be doing to alleviate the possible problems that are, that are going to be brought on by this future? Sure. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with the, some of the ways the technology is progressing. Um, I'm more, much more concerned about uh, the ability of our skills, our organizations, and our institutions to adapt. I see that's where the real bottleneck is today. Um, and we can, we can make progress on all those fronts. Um, particularly, we need to reinvent education. There are some tools with um, digital, uh, massive online open courseware, for instance, that have potential. But we need to focus more on, on helping with creativity and interpersonal skills. We also need to do more in terms of encouraging people to uh, be entrepreneurial and help invent some of the new goods and services and industries that will employ people. And finally, we have to take more seriously the need for new kinds of tax policy and redistribution, um, start evaluating earned income tax credit, negative income taxes, guaranteed minimal income. And on the panel today, we talked about an idea that Mariana had of a more widespread capital ownership, um, getting people to basically uh, own some of the robots that have been taking the jobs. And if capital ownership becomes more widespread, then we're likely to get more widespread prosperity as well. All right. So it sounds like in that case, uh, I'm talking right now to a telepresence robot at a conference about telepresence. Right? We've got the means to fix things. The question is, I guess, do we have the political will? Can I just say one quick of thing, course. which is let's not, I mean, let's for a minute just think globally. So I think Eric was talking about some optimism, say, perhaps in the U.S., where you still have very active funding. In Europe today, this uh, fiscal compact, for example, is forcing countries like Spain to cut their publicly funded R&D by 40 percent since 2009. So we have to remember that there is also this sort of you know, political discussion around the world on what is the role of the state, what is not, should the state step back or should it step up. I, I would just encourage governments worldwide to not think like that. What we need to think is how to actually set up those types of public organizations that can think big, can welcome failure, but especially attract the kind of expertise that, say, the DOE, the Department of Energy, recently was run by a Nobel Prize winning physicist. How cool is that? <laughs> Uh, and that's not the trajectory I'm seeing in Europe today. 
All right. Well, thanks to both of you. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure being here. <laughs> thanks, Eric. Bye.